Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's tea time. I don't have my tea, but I hope you do. Maybe a cup of coffee. As we hang out talking about tech and space and SpaceX and Starlink and all of this goodness. Today we're gonna be talking about lunar landings. And there was two, two attempts, two kind of landings, one successful, one not so successful. I wanna get into it with you. I was gonna talk to you guys about it last week, but I couldn't. And the reason being was Starship kept on being delayed and then delayed again and then finally launched, then blowing up and there was a lot to talk about. So today we're gonna to be talking about this lunar landing, multiple lunar landings. And I think this is fascinating because I'm a lunar baby. So I was born in 69, which is when we ended up landing on the moon, right? We had Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Apollo 11 and the whole idea of placing that flag, the American flag on the surface of the moon is a big thing, and especially when you're growing up in that time, it was really big, it was really big. So for me, seeing any lunar landings, I think it's awesome. I think it's just amazing if you think about it, because it's not an easy task. It is not easy, but now we're seeing that NASA's kind of commissioned commercial companies to do it for them. So there's scientific things that they want to carry out, but they say, okay, we're going to put a contract for you, a contract for you, a contract for you, and we want these 10 scientific experiments done or placed on the lunar surface, however. So, and that's what they did. And that is part of this CLPS or CLPS program, which is kind of interesting. It's a commercial lunar payload service or services. This is kind of what it is. And NASA is spending millions, I should say hundreds of millions on this program. And once again, it's successful and not so successful. And I wanna get into it with you today. And I wanna know your thoughts on this. I was reading an article over on, I think it was Space Explored or something. I wanna share some of it with you. I'll give you my commentary. Once again, I'm not a rocket scientist here, but we're gonna commentate on it. And then I wanna hear from you down below, because some of you guys might be rocket scientists. Uh, down below, let me know what I get right and what I get wrong. And what do you think about this? So let's jump right into this article. It starts out by saying last week was a big week for NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, once again, or called CLPS, as it saw two landings by two different companies. The hope was that the agency would end up with two successful providers of NASA science to the moon's surface. Instead, it saw one with the other falling over once again. I'll get into that in just a second. Firefly's near-perfect landing. On March 2nd, Firefly successfully touched down on the lunar surface on its first attempt. This started the week off on a high note, with the company overcoming the odds of failing on its first landing attempt, as we've seen so many times before. While the company took the longest to get Blue Ghost lander ready, it seemed to have paid off, as it looks to be the only one that can actually do it. This marked Firefly as the first U.S. company from NASA's CLPS program to complete a soft landing on the moon, which also makes it the first company to land on the moon as well. The short and wider lander carried with it 10 science payloads for NASA, eight of which already begun gathering data. Not to show off, Firefly did share a dramatic montage of its final stages of landing on the northern portion of the moon's near side. The video ends with a dramatic silhouette of the landing reminiscent to images captured on Apollo 11. Intuitive machines, sideways yet again. On Thursday, March 6, that's four days later, Intuitive Machines was due for a lunar landing attempt. Its IM-2 lander named Athena sadly did not stick the landing. Similar to IM-1, the lander ended up on its side. Given a much taller and skinnier base compared to Blue Ghost, it led to some rather humorous comments regarding playing Kerbal Space Program. If you guys played Kerbal Space Program. It's, it's basically a really cute, kind of cartoon, but real video game where you build a rocket and you launch the rocket, but it has like all of the, let's say physics baked into it. So if you do not get it right, the rocket's not gonna launch right. You're gonna smash it or whatever. So it's definitely cute and I love that. They're like, you know, maybe if you play Kerbal more, you'll know not to build a craft that looks like that. 
pretty simple, kind of harsh, but definitely simple. Anyways, it finalizes with, for what it's worth, it appears that Athena's IM2 landed much softer than the company's first attempt as there is no mention of broken landing legs. It's always good. However, the argument for being another soft landing by the company would be incorrect. However, Intuitive Machines has done twice what others have not been able to do once, land and operate a spacecraft on the moon's surface. That's true. Sadly, Athena's operation on the lunar surface was cut short due to its location in a crater on the lunar surface. Intuitive Machines determined it would not be able to recharge the lander's batteries. Makes sense because because it's in a shadow, it's in a crater. Probably not a good thing. While some payload operations were complete, millions of dollars worth of potential science data were not collected. Yes. So, once again, it ended up landing on its side. I love these two pictures, all right? Let me just show these to you. You can see on one side, you can see fireflies, blue ghost, and it's sitting there. It's very plump on the bottom. It almost looks like a cone. And you could just recognize that the greatest amount of mass of that spacecraft is on the lower portion of it. So it's very, let's say, stubby. It's very short and compact, but wide. That makes sense, right? Whereas with the other one that you can see toppled over and you can see the earth between its legs. Not so stubby, not so wide, and much taller. So that is a major problem. That is a design problem that I think needs to be addressed. And the reason being is the last time it came in a little bit too hot and it broke a leg off and then it toppled over. This time, I don't know if it came in hot or not, but it landed in a crater. Most likely it was probably extremely soft. And at that point, the legs dug in and it probably toppled over once again because the greatest mass is in this long section that makes it taller instead of wider. I guarantee you, even if the Firefly Company's blue ghost was to land in the exact same spot, it wouldn't topple over just by the design of it. So, Kerbal guys, play the video game Kerbal. You will redesign it and you'll get it right this third time. <laughs> Anyways, to kind of like sum up here. So Firefly Aerospace, it is a wider base, less tall, much shorter. They received $101 million from NASA, a NASA contract. It took them longer to make, but it was successful. In comparison to Intuitive Machines with their Athena, that this is attempt number two, where I am one ended up toppling over with a broken leg, and now I am two toppled over, not with a broken leg, but once again with a mass not in the right spot, let's say. The greatest amount of mass not in the right spot, in my personal opinion. So that ended up costing $62.5 million. So we have $101 million with the Firefly Company. We have Intuitive Machines with $62.5 million, $40 million difference. Now, would that $40 million difference make a difference? I could, it could. I just personally think it's a design flaw, period. It's just a design flaw they need to address. If they did an IM3 and they kept the same design and maybe made stronger legs or wider legs, I think it would just be stupid. That's my personal opinion. If I was NASA, I wouldn't give them the money. Supposedly within about 12 to 15 months, both companies are going to launch their next craft to the moon. 12 to 15 months. So we'll see what ends up happening. Once again, we have one that was successful, fully successful, still sending out data. And then we have the other one that was semi-successful that actually made it there, which is a big thing, um, but ended up collecting very minimal amounts of data for their $62.5 million. Was it a waste? No, because NASA will probably do it again. My question to you is, should they? Should it be like three strikes and you're out? Should they give them another contract? Maybe even make it 100 million instead of 62 million? Maybe. I mean, they made it there. I mean, this is not easy. Once again, we did it back in 1969, if you guys believe that we did. I believe that we did, and we did it with slide rules. There was no supercomputers. There was no computers at all. 
Actually, our phone has a better computer or CPU in it than anything that they had available to them in 1969 when we got them to the moon with Apollo 11. So that in itself is just amazing. It reminds me when people look at like the pyramids, right? And they're like, how did they stack this stuff up? These are massive blocks. How did they do it? Ingenuity. They used your mind. They didn't allow the computer to tell them stuff. They actually did it. Once again, with slide rules. <laughs> with a slide ruler, that was it. They didn't have all of the technology that we have today. So when we don't get it right today, with all of the technology, it makes you wonder. The other side note to this is, like I said before, we need to land in the appropriate spot. And we have to do it autonomously, right? We cannot guide it in with a joystick and land the thing. You know, it's just, you can't do that. That being said, these things need to have a ton of radar, LIDAR, all kinds of stuff built into it, lasers, whatever, to determine where to land and where not to land. If the unit or the craft sees that it's going to land in a crater, it needs to then move to another location or land on the edge of the crater, not inside of it. Because once it goes inside, it's game over because it's not getting sun anymore, so there's no more power. It's the end of the line. So it needs to be able to do this autonomously. Just like I said with Elon Musk, SpaceX's Starship, when we start seeing those things land on Mars, it needs to be able to do it autonomously and get it right. There's like no second chance. Once again, they're traveling for four, six, seven months in space to get to Mars. And then to go and blow it up because you toppled the damn thing over because you landed on a edge of a mountain somewhere on a rock. Well, that's a problem, okay? They need to address that well before they even attempt to send a starship there. Because once again, even if it gets there, it doesn't matter if it blows up on re-entry or if it blows up just toppling over. Something stupid like that. Or landing in a crater. <sighs> like intuitive machines did. Once again, uh, I don't know. Anyways, what say you? Down below, I would love to hear from you. What do you think? Do you think that Intuitive Machines, do you think they should get that money so they have the Athena 2? Maybe rename it? Do you think also should they do a complete redesign on it? Like I said, where we have that lower center of gravity, where the greatest mass is towards the bottom, not in this long toppling over nonsense and I just don't understand it at all. Once again, play Kerbal and you'll understand that you can't do that. The thing will topple over unless you land it perfectly and if you land on anything soft, it's still going to topple over. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I just make it too simplistic. I don't know. Anyways, once again, what say you? What do you think should go on? Should NASA pay up and see the trifecta happen, you know? Do you think they should go for the hat trick and say, well, maybe they'll bust another the leg off or maybe they'll be successful. Do you think NASA should give them the same $62.5 million or should they pay up and make it $100, $101 million like they did for Firefly? Down below, I would love to hear from you. Anyways, if you enjoyed the content, throw it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're not, if you are, thank you so much. Click this notification button over here so when I go live when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. And if you want to say thank you for all of my hard work on this channel, there's a little thank you button. Click on that. Give a dollar or two if you like. If not, it's perfectly fine. The video is still free. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. And if you want more SpaceX Starlink content, I've put together 440 video. I know, 440 videos over the last 44, 45 months just for you. Helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy, everything about SpaceX Starlink and mesh networks and all kinds of goodness. SpaceX in general. Check them out when you're done watching this video. I'll put a link over here. It is a playlist just for you. And finally, head over to my website, jchristina.com, where you can find all of my merch and my tees and my shirts and my mugs and my books and all the rest of this stuff. Check it out. Go to jchristina.com if there's something there that you like. Pick it up. Help support me and my family. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay connected. And we'll see you on the lunar surface. Maybe not. Take care, guys.